Well, we're going to start uh, reading Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So uh, in reading this scripture, I, I was just drawn to this passage um, this week and, and considering uh, uh, the things that uh, are happening around us and considering the, uh, I, I was thinking of all of you uh, this week. And, and uh, as I uh, was reading and, and drawn to this passage to read, and I, just in thinking about you, uh, all of you, myself and and those that are not here today as well. Um, just in thinking about us, I, I was thinking about all of the things that we've been through. And all the, you know, in our lives, of course, we've all been through different things and maybe had different struggles at different times, right? You know, we all have. And I have the privilege and the honor of, of uh, knowing all of you at different points in time and, you know, discussed different things with you and prayed with you and, and been aware of various happenings in your lives and the things that you've been, uh, the, the things that you've gone through. And listen what it says. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, there, there's always that litmus test. The, the only lit, litmus test that there is to answer this question, are you going to heaven? Are you a Christian? Are you, are you going to heaven? There's only one litmus test. And that's not a test that I can give you. It's the test of whether or not you know, in, deep in your soul, deep in your heart, that you are a child of God. If you know that, if you know in your heart that you're born again, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you have received him, then the Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that you are a son of God, a daughter of God, that you are a child of God. Look, no one can convince me that I'm not going to heaven. I'm not afraid to die. I, I know I'm going to heaven. going to be better. Praise God. It's going to be better. Now, you know, I, I'm happy. I'm a happy man. But praise God, it's going to be better. <laughs> and I'll take that. I'll take better. I'm not afraid to die. They can't do anything to me but kill my body. They can't kill the real me. The real me is that part that's going to live on forever. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's wonderful. And if we are children of God, then we are heirs. Let's let that sink in for a moment. We're heirs of God. We're his heirs. And what happens with an heir? Do you have any heirs? Or are you anybody else's heir? They're, you receive what they have. You receive what they have. We are heirs of God. That's better than being John Rockefeller's heir. Or I, I've been, I, I, my wife and I love to watch historical things, documentaries and things like that. And there's this one thing on the History Channel, The Men Who Built America. Now, yeah, I love that too. But now, in, in, on, in all honesty, you know, uh, sometimes we in America tend to make capitalism our God. Capitalism is not our religion. It is only our economic system. Capitalism is not our form of government. It is only our economic system. Right? So let's Keep that in proper perspective. But, you know, being an heir of God is better than being Vanderbilt's heir. It's better than being Rockefeller's heir. You know? Pardon? 
Yeah. Yeah. There's no earthly heir that can receive more than you will receive in your father's kingdom. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. A joint heir with Jesus Christ. Now, what did Jesus inherit? Divinity? What did he inherit? The, the kingdom. He inherited the kingdom. You're a co heir with Christ. You're a co heir with Christ. You inherit the kingdom of heaven. If heirs join heirs with Christ, oh, there's always that little <coughs> caveat in there. I didn't say caviar in there. I said caveat in there. If indeed, what's it say? Oh, I wish this wasn't there. Cross this out. You have my permission to cross it? No, you can't, unfortunately. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. If indeed we suffer with Christ, we will be glorified together with him. Think about that for a minute. What are you going through right now? What are you going through? I know what I'm going through. Well, my wife and I are dealing with all her sickness and things that she deals with and uh, physically, and I know how difficult that makes it. What are you going through? You know? I mean, Kathy's family's dealing with the, the loss of her mother. Um, uh, Sue shared with me this morning something she's going through right now. What are you going through? What are you dealing with right now? What are you suffering right now? If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, when we suffer through something, when we suffer something, when we suffer through something, it can do one of two things. It can make us bitter or better, one or the other. Think about that once. Just give some thought to that. When you're going through something, what will that suffering do? Paul's showing us here that we have to indeed, in this passage, he shows us all the way, if you were to read all the way over through the end of the, uh, end of the eighth chapter, Paul shares with us this human condition of suffering and what we must go through in this suffering uh, process, so to speak to be glorified together with Christ, to be glorified with him. We must go by way of, of Jesus, by way of suffering, by way of this human condition. Look over at Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 39. I'm sure you know this passage, but... Matthew 10, 37 to 39. Listen to what Jesus says. This is a hard saying. This is hard. It really is. You know, I think Jesus was a feminine guy carrying a sheep around his shoulder. He was a tough cookie sometimes. This is a hard saying. Read what Jesus says. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. I mean, you know, the child grows up just loving their parents. We honor them. We, we, we love them. Naturally, we, we rely on them for everything. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. With parents, uh, we love our children. We love them. We do anything for them. 
There's nothing I wouldn't do for my son or my daughter. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who, 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 who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, Jesus said. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now, taking up your cross is not like one, one action or one symbolic action or one uh, action that you must do. But it, it, it symbolizes being ready and willing to give your very life for the Lord if need be. Ready and willing to give any sacrifice so long as he is asking it of you. I was watching something on TV this week about cults. See, I told you I, I love to watch the documentaries and stuff like that. And, you know, you can't believe some of the crazy, idiotic things that people buy into in these cults. And some of the cults that they were doing the documentaries on, you know, and the things that, that people were doing. But they were literally uh, sacrificing it, making incredible sacrifices for these false religious leaders, you know? And I said, Jesus wants us to be willing to sacrifice anything that he is asking us to sacrifice. The distinction there being in, in a cult, the, the leader of the cult is creating that sacrifice and making people sacrifice and enforcing these things. It's a false religious view. It, it, it's, it's not so in Christianity. In, in Christianity, it's God who calls for sacrifice. And if he's calling you to sacrifice something, then sacrifice it. Oft times, it's something we hold dear, it's something we hold on to, Something we want to keep, and he wants us to give, to give it up. Off times, that is what is, is the sacrifice that is needed. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who finds his life, you know, I, I, you know I love the Declaration of Independence, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but the original words were property. That was the original wording. Uh, life, liberty, and property, the pursuit of property. And, you know, I mean, honestly, much of our uh, effort and focus and trial and struggle and strength and time and uh, dedication and purpose, etc., is wrapped up in what? Earning a living, providing for our families, acquiring stuff. Is that honest? It's honest. I don't care if you're rich or you're poor. You've, you're, you're, you're much of your concern and effort and thought and et cetera, et cetera, is in the, uh, is in the survival. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll just kick them out of the way. Although they are sacred to me, they are copies of the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Copies of the Constitution, they are sacred to me. And, and, and Jesus says, he who finds his life will lose it. It doesn't mean that we should stop trying. And it doesn't mean that we should give up. And it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, try to do the best that we can in life. Listen, if, if I don't have something, I can't give it away. 
right? But if I have something, I can give it. Isn't that right? So, Jesus, the Lord, wants to bless his, his people. He wants to bless us so that we can give away, so that we can be a funnel for things in the kingdom, so that we can funnel things in the kingdom. The, he who finds his life will lose it. When we talk about that passage or that statement, we're talking about someone who finds his life and is now contented and happy with his accomplishments and putting them ahead of his God, putting them before his God. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who, he who gives up his own rights. Today in our society, everybody is so concerned about their rights. Don't you diss me! I'll give you the evil eye. Don't you diss me! How dare you say that or call me that or insinuate this or that or the other thing? Everybody's so worried about their rights. Jesus gave up his rights. As a, a sheep before the shearers dumb, he stood before Pilate when he could have called legions of, of, of angels to defend him. And he didn't. He gave up his rights. We fight so hard for ours. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Look at Hebrews 5. Real quickly. Flip back there to Hebrews 5, uh, verse 7. It's talking, of course, about Jesus, right? Who in the days of his flesh, in other words, when he was here on the earth with us, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears. Now, that sounds an awful lot to me, like interceding and praying and crying out for, for, for his own life. He was crying out before God for his own life. Father, is it possible that this cup can pass from me? I don't want to drink it. I don't want to die. I don't want to be crucified. And we're not talking about just a few tears or a few... Uh, a, a few little bits of crying out. We're talking about, it says there, vehement tears and crying before God. Christ cried out vehemently before the Father. To him who was able to save him from death, And now listen, and was heard, and was heard, Jesus cried out before God, and was heard. Right? God heard his cries. And yet still, the Father, the answer was, no, I can't let this cup pass from you. I can't take this away. You have to walk through this, son. You have to walk through this, son. Right? 
You have to go through this. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So, how did Jesus become perfected? I mean, we know he was divine. Uh, divine. <laughs> Thank you. We know he was divine, but how did he become perfected? Sacrifice through suffering. By obedience, which he had to learn through suffering, he was perfected, right? The Bible says he became, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. It's really interesting. The focus of all that is on obedience. The focus of all that is on obedience. Right? To all who obey him, Jesus obeyed God, suffering all that he suffered, going to the cross, became obedient even unto death. Great suffering brings great glory. Look at Luke chapter 18. Look at Luke 18, 18. You know this story. The story of the rich young ruler, right? Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Notice Jesus, there's one obvious one that Jesus left out, the one that would deal with riches, the, the do not covet. Right? He left that, left that out, didn't he? In that list. He left it out. And, 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 and he said, the young man said, all these things I've kept from my youth. So when Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Go and sell all that you have. Go and sell all that you have. And this rich young ruler went away very sorrowful because what? He, he couldn't do that. He couldn't do that. He wasn't able to, to give away all that he had. He wasn't able to let go of all of those accomplishments and all that wealth and, all, yeah, the pride of life. He wasn't able to let go of that. And, and, and give those things up to follow Jesus. Now, we know that, you know, Jesus, when he saw uh, that he became very sorrowful, he said, it's, it's so hard for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then later on, he says, thank God all things are possible. Those things that are impossible with men are possible with God. In and of ourselves, and in and of our own flesh, etc., you know, we wouldn't give anything away. We wouldn't give up the things that we have and that we've worked so hard for, etc. But God in us, working in us, teaching us, uh, 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 teaching us to honor Him, etc., we, we learn to be generous. We learn to, uh, to give. We learn to love others more 
than our comfort or more than our, our goods and our material things. Thank God those things are, are possible with God. This rich young ruler was called to give up his life. And he went away very sad because he, 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 he couldn't do it. He was called to take up his cross and follow Christ. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Go back to Romans, if you would. Same chapter. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's talking about the Holy Spirit in us and, and working through us and even relates back to uh, one of my favorite verses, likewise, verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses for we do not know how to pray, uh, what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. God intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Holy Ghost just, just works through us and cries out on our behalf to God. He knows what the will of God is and He knows the hearts and minds. He knows what in our hearts needs to be given to God. And He intercedes for us. According to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now put all this together. For whom he foreknew, that being you and I, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. How would we possibly be conformed to the image of his son if we didn't, ha if we didn't go through some suffering? Life is full of hardship. Now, I'm not saying that God purposes every, um, every hardship or every awful thing that comes into our lives. Uh, because there's many awful things that come into our lives. But God is able to use those things to work all things together for good. Because of the things that we go through, we're able to uh, empathize with others who go through those things. Because of the difficulties and hardships that we go through, we're able to love others uh, who are going through difficult times that may be a little unlovely. <laughs> Have you ever seen that before? Somebody went, look, when you're going through a hard time, it's not the prettiness that comes out of you. When, when you're going through difficulty, you know, it's like that difficulty weighs you down and pushes down and pushes down and pushes down. And what, what happens if you ever take a, 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 a cup or a can and turn it upside down and push it down in water? What happens when, when you let it go? Right? Or compress a spring far enough and what happens? Soon you won't be able to hold it back. That's the stuff in you and I that when we are under pressure because of difficulty in our lives, that's the stuff that's, that we're pushing down on there and holding down in, trying to keep that stuff from showing. And that pressure compresses that spring till it explodes. Till it pops up. All that wickedness comes out of us. And no matter how good we are, we still have unevangelized places in our heart.
Even Paul ripped into Peter. Didn't he? He did. He ripped into Peter. I'm sure he could have said what he said more politely. <laughs> what I'm saying is the difficult things that we endure, the hardships that we go through, they, they, uh, they conform us to the image of Christ if we allow them to. If we allow them to, they will conform us to the image of Christ. Christ endured suffering, the suffering of the cross, for the prize that was set before him, which was the, to, to gain the ability to redeem mankind. There's this process. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he called, and whom he called, these he justified, and whom he justified, these he glorified. So there's a process, there's a process that we go through to, to become, in the end, glorified. Paul talks about receiving our glorified bodies, right? Our spiritual bodies. And, you know, to, to get there, there's a process that we have to go through, and that process must include suffering. That process must include suffering. It's part of the human condition. Look over verse... Uh, Look at verse 37. And you know this. Yet in, in all these things, in all what things? In all these sufferings. In all the things that we must go through of suffering in our lives, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're more than conquerors through him who who loved us. That more than conquerors phrase, it's two Greek words, and, and, and it really, uh, like, the first one is hupo, and, it, and it, it's almost like where we get our word hyper from. Hyperdrive. Hyper whatever, you know, you put on, right? And what's it mean when you say, say that? To the max, the most it can possibly ever be. More than enough, more than you can imagine, completely and totally uh, um, successful, completely and totally a conqueror. Hyper, over and above, super victorious. That is what we're aiming for. That is what we're coming to is the Holy Spirit makes us more than conquerors through him who loved us. For listen, I don't know what you're in right now. I don't know all the problems that you might be facing. But, for, but I am persuaded that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, not only what you're going through now, but what you'll be going through in five years. Anything present and anything to come, not height nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from his love. Isn't that good news? You know, we, sometimes we go through things and we don't go through them well. Right? Sometimes we go through things and it seems like we pass the test. Right? It doesn't, it, I don't want to say it doesn't matter. It matters, but it doesn't matter. It won't separate you from his love. 
fail the test, pass the test. It won't separate you from his love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us from his love. Amen. What more then can we say? What more can we say? Life is full of difficulties. But nothing can separate us from his love. We're going to receive communion together at this time. Whatever those difficulties are that you are going through, His love demonstrated in his body, his blood, are enough for us. They are enough for our overcoming. They're enough for our overcoming. Amen? The body and blood of Jesus Christ. I done preach myself happy today. I wasn't happy when I came this morning. I'm happy now. The body and blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you. We love you, Father. Thank you for the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and distribute the communion elements. Whatever you're going through today, Whatever you are dealing with, whatever you are going through today, I want you to think of that as you receive this communion. Not thinking of that as something that is overcoming you. Not thinking of that as, oh, God, what am I going to do? Not thinking of that of, oh, how, how, what can I do? How can I do this? What can I do here? What can I do there? No. Thinking of that in that it is merely part of this world's condition. It is merely part of, of the trial and, and uh, the difficulty that we must go through to learn obedience, part of the hardship that we must go through uh, in order to give uh, our lives to Christ completely. Remembering that what we're going through right now, that these present difficulties, these present trials are, are merely a, a temptation, merely a short-term thing, and that all of eternity we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. More than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. And now I've received of the Lord that which I've given to you, Paul said. And that the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. He said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Let's receive the body of Christ together. we thank you. Thank you that Christ's body was broken for us, that it was broken for our healing. Thank you. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we remember the blood of Jesus Christ and how he shed his blood for a new covenant for us. Thank you, Lord. Let's 
receive the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the strength for every day. We don't need the strength today for every day. We need the strength today for today. Thank you, Father. Thank you that your body and your blood carry us through every trial, every temptation. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning.